Salante, 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 and take a jab. Tonga Ketmo, Manakurangi, Sarawi, and Tanga Beben or Jabi. Salante, salante, man. Sangaharam ta chika jabe, salang jabe chika jabe. Janudas, Flatlanders. Do you know what the people from Northeast Kingdom of Vermont call those outsiders that come on in here to take photograph of the leaf them in the fall? What? what? Flatlanders. <laughs> because? Because. Watch this. Them don't have no mountains where them people they come from. Well, Nepal has the Mount Everest. What do they call Nepali people? Flatlanders. <laughs> and people from Ghana? Flatlanders. Let me guess. People mm -hmm. from Somalia? <laughs> Flatlanders. I guess we all have that in common. Recuerdos de la infancia, childhood memories. We all have childhood memories. I have a lot, but there's one specific childhood memory that is always fresh in my mind. I have never seen or met another human being as kind and caring as my mother. When I was a teenager, I used to have a lot of friends. We used to go up on this hill, shove our bikes up there, and ride them down at breakneck speed. One weekend, all of us got together again, pushed the bikes up the hill, coming down very fast. Came around the corner. There was a tree branch in the road. A couple of us fell down, me included, as of course. Uh, broke my bike, ruined my sneakers. The following weekend, there was supposed to be a dance. Uh, I, my mom asked me, Tony, you can't go to dance. You have no sneakers. I went up to her, thought about it for a while, and I said, Mom, can I borrow your sneakers to go to the dance? I mean, yeah, I wear my mother's sneakers to dance. She said, of course you can. Without the blink of an eye, not even a thought about it, I wore my mother's sneakers to the dance that weekend. She has made so much sacrifice for her children. I have never loved anyone, will not ever love anyone as much as I love my mother. Toya Fosio always told us that she was a very good Somali girl. She lived with my grandmother. 
She never went anywhere. She cleaned the house. Model kid. Then one day, she met Abo. He was this dusty village kid from another tribe. They soon fell in love and began writing letters to one another. They decided to elope without telling my grandmother, of course. My mother came home after she eloped and got a really good whipping. They were not allowed to see each other for a year. Finally, it went to court, and the judge looked at both of my parents, well, they didn't know it at the time, and asked them if they wanted to get married. And they said yes. So that is what happened. In my country, Sudan, it was difficult for girls to get an education. Educate, uh, but my grandfather and grandmother believed that they should educate their daughter, my mom. They believed that education would give her confidence, that she would trust in herself to make good choices for herself and for her children. So my mother was educated and my father was also educated. He was an accountant. They believed that I should be educated. You have to find ways to entertain yourself as cheaply as possible. So, when I was little, I, my friends and I would pretend that long rocks were phones and we'd pretend to have like walkie-talkies. <laughs> um, anything circular when you're a child in a refugee camp is a soccer ball. Here are some examples. Old socks, plastic bags, condoms, they're all soccer balls. Um, being a kid, we had to accept that. That was all you knew. You either accepted it or you weren't happy. I was born into generational poverty. My dad was around, but he was not really in my life. I lived with my mom and my two sisters. I spent a lot of time playing soccer on a daily basis. After high school, I was fortunate enough to be adopted by my uncle, who did not have a child of his own. On graduation, I told my mom that I would like to join the Ghana Army. But my mom was a little skeptical for fear of being killed. I told my uncle that I would like to play professional soccer. And he also discouraged me. They both wanted me to continue school and become a teacher. In Africa, we always have to listen to our elders. I listened to both of them, and I went through teacher training college to become a teacher, and I became a middle school social studies teacher. My name is Rakutra Zafi Mikhail Anatol, but everyone calls me Mika. My nickname growing up uh, was Mika Heli, which means Lily Mika. I grew up in Tuamasna on the east coast of Madagascar. There were six kids in my family, two girls and four boys. I'm the second to last. We didn't have a radio and no TV. My parents sang and they played games. Then, we went to bed. My mother told me that even when I was three years old, I was already singing. When I was a little older, I started to teach myself how to play instruments. I played guitar. Later, I taught myself the valia. I didn't go too far in school. I love school. I got a good grade, but we were in a hard situation when 
I got to high school. Sometimes we didn't even have food to eat. My parents couldn't afford to pay for all of us to go to our schooling. We discussed it as a family, and we decided that my parents would pay for my second older, oldest brother to go to university so that the, he could support the family in the future. He took on that responsibility. Mm. <clears throat> hey. My name is Timba Chasa, but if you need, you call me Timba. 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 Yes, Timba. <sighs> when I was five, my dad came home from work every day. Twice a week, he said, Timba, let's go to do the boxing club. We will go see if you want to be a boxer. I watched for one, one week, then two weeks, then three weeks. I say, Dad, this sport interests me. I want, to, I want to do it. So I start training. My dad's friend, the coach, say, Timba, uh, drop and push up, push ups. I, ha I had never tried push ups before. He said, one, two, three. Then I start crying. This is difficult. He said, you need to complete 50, you know, five zero. Is <laughs> it too much? You know, I won't sleep that night, so tired. The next morning at 4 a.m., you know 4 a.m.? It's good sleeping. The coach woke me up. We are, we are going for art running. Three hours, one fast. I said, after one hour, I said, I'm too tired. Too tired, please call taxi. The coach said, I don't have money for the taxi. It's called another boxer carrying me back. <laughs> One week, then two weeks, then three weeks. I was getting strong, you know, because I'm practice. The coach said, you are going to fight in a boxing March. <laughs> Look at the place, it's a big problem. <laughs> I was five. <laughs> five. Hey, old, five. <laughs> the boy I was fighting was seven years old, me. Look at the difference, two years. <laughs> He's, he was tall, me and more heavy and bigger. We, are, we were in the ring. He came towards me. I was standing down. One, two, three, 
I'm fall down. I'm not scared because I'm not strong. <laughs> when I was I was seven, seven, the coach said to me, Timba, you must focus. <laughs> you are sorry, you must fight in the championship in the city. He told, he told my dad, he said, okay, my dad said, okay. And his present, he gave me uh, inside the box, gloves and shoes, and one mouth gum to put in my teeth, and medicine, when, it's my, when it's the person fighting, they bound me here. I need it medicine. <sighs> they said I must win. But but the day of the city champion, the guy I was fighting was very big. I was 45 pounds. <laughs> he was 57 pounds. Look at the difference. <laughs> My coach is see me, I'm scared. He said, Timba, she called me Timba. Focus. 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 <laughs> Relax. <laughs> and then I win. I win the championship. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Estos son trasfondos de los inmigrantes. These are immigration backstories. My name is Derek. I was born in Jamaica in the countryside in a place called Portland. I had six sisters. I was the only boy, first child, never been spoiled. <laughs> my dad worked for the state as an accountant. My mom, she was the kind of seamstress that I don't think we can find around today. She would take measurements from her clients, show them one of those uh, Sears type of books. You pick a dress, she take your measurement, and she would make anything male or female, no problem. After high school, I went to a trade school to be a machinist. I finished my course, tried to get a job, could not get a job in that town because there were only one machine shop in there. So I left and went to Kingston where I spent some time. In Kingston, I was kind of running with some of the you know, bad guys, you call them. So, so my father, for some reason, got wind of it and got me a job at the Holiday Inn in Montego Bay as a front desk clerk. I worked there for a while, but the money wasn't really what I wanted. I wanted more, so I started doing a little tax business on the side. By then, I had two boys, Derek Jr. and Theodore. I wanted everything for those kids. I wanted to treat them like gold. After I stopped school at 16 or 17, I didn't have anything to do, but music was in my heart. So I played in the streets, or I hung out with friends. I started drinking because I was depressed. It was bad, so bad. All the men 
of my family drunk. My father drunk until he died. My oldest brother drunk until he died. One day, I was very drunk. Someone came to me and said, somebody wants to talk to you. He was the owner of a recording studio. So I went to talk to him the next day. He said, Mika, you have to stop drinking. You are very talented. I would like you to take care of your talent. I have a bunch of instruments. I have a studio, small studio. If you want to learn about computer and recording. Now, I didn't want to go party with friends anymore. I just want to make music day and night. I wrote the songs or sat behind the computer. In 1994, I recorded a song for the Alliance Francaise Song Contest. It was called Ambanivolo. It means countryside. It is about how people should look after the forest and the animals. People really liked the song. I won. Yeah. <laughs> then, thank you. I started recording songs with some of the legendary Malagasy and European musicians. I built relationships. I started to make little money and it felt good. I could now help my mother. It was an international competition and people from Canada and Europe started to like my music. In 2005, I collaborated with a famous Malagasy songwriter and it was a huge success. Now, I had to start to get recognized when the kids saw me, they were screaming, Mika, Mika. <laughs> oh, I have always been a bit shy. <laughs> there were more hits. My band turned to Europe. Now I was playing all the time. I was a successful musician. I was famous. I didn't plan it. But that is what happened. I just believe in Zangahari, the god of the Malagas people and all of us. One of my best memories growing up was with my uncle. But then I had a fallout with my uncle. I had to leave his house and I left in tears. I became stranded as a result. But then as the saying goes, when one door is shut, another one is open. I connected with a friend that I went to school with in high school, and this friend was fortunate to have a dad open a cultural center in some part of Ghana, where people from the United States would go and learn about African culture. And I was part of the teachers that had to take them through the various lessons. That was when I connected, I met a friend who was with a group from Vermont known as Vermont Global Village Project. And this person actually worked at Fletcher Allen Hospital in Burlington. 
We, came in, we became very close friends, and her, and her, her return to Burlington, Vermont, she extended an invitation for me to come visit the United States. And those of you who know how the visa process works, especially with visa, visitors' visa, there should be some conditions that ties you back to your home country so that when you come to visit, they know that based on those ties, you return at the end of, at the expiration of your visa. And I had three ties. One, I was married. Two, I had a baby. And three, I was a full-time teacher. So based on those three conditions, I got my visitor's visa. In 1978, I left Jamaica for a job with Carnival Cruise Lines. I worked on the Mardi Gras ship for about nine years. I started as a busboy. Eventually, I got my waiter's jacket. The, you know, people always say to me, that work is so hard. For me, the work was fun. I felt freedom. And then I met Shelley. Mm. I got to tell you about Shelley. That Sunday, particularly, was supposed to be my vacation time. Because you work eight months, you get three months or two months off. That Sunday, I was supposed to go home or go, you know, just get off of the ship. My maitre d' came to me that morning and said, after the ship docked, says, well, Derek, you can't go home today because the waiter that's supposed to replace you did not come in, so you have to work another week. I mean, I was not happy about it, but nothing I could do about it. So naturally, we clear our tables, set them up, passengers come on. As usual, the waiters line up. To, to see the passengers in the dining room. There we are lining up the maitre d'. We always doing like stuff like peeking over and you know, trying to see which, where the girls are, single <laughs> girls. So, so, so the maitre d' always says, hey guys, please, go back in line. What, what's the matter with you? They're coming on the ship. We go back in line, we would step back out as soon as he turned his back. I went out, did one of them things, and oh boy, there she was. I said, oh boy, yes. <laughs> Pushed myself here, took her and put her on my station. <laughs> so so for, for that entire week, I did everything I could to take this young lady out when she was in port. Was not happening. She said, nope, nope, not happening. We've been married now for 35 years. <laughs> Same girl. It's funny. She said to me after a year or so, do you know what I was thinking when you tried to take me out that week? Nope, would you tell me? She said, oh yeah. I was thinking to myself, why in heaven's name, would I want to go out with this short, funny speaking, black person? <laughs> so, so, <laughs> persistence, persistence, persistence got me right here. And of course, many other things. Thank you. Also, yeah. also, I have a love story. In 2012, I met Maya, a blonde American woman, at one of my concerts. She was the director of a local nonprofit 
we fell in love. My music continued. My life is a long story. Some of it good, some of it sad. In 2003, my father died. In 2010, my oldest brother died. Then, in 2013, my older brother, the one who was the breadwinner for the family, died in the Congo. It was a big shock for my family. My music continued. My life with Maya continued. We got married in a beautiful, traditional Malagasy wedding. We decided to move to the United States. We started to figure out how to make that happen. It was a lot of work and took over a year. Was Hoyo and Abba's favorite, I mean third, child. <laughs> Shortly after I was conceived, Abba was, sponsor was sponsored by my uncle Ali to come to the United States, leaving behind my sister Hawa and my brother Mohammed and my mother Hoyo in our small village of Badan, Somalia. Where we lived was very peaceful. Even though it was time of war, we didn't see it. I was a very curious and adventurous little girl. I remember when I was about four or five, I volunteered to herd the goats inside my grandparents' farm. Of course, no one had told me that there'd be hyenas. So here I was, bringing the goats in. They were yipping and prowling from side to side. And I got most of them in. They did take two. When I got back inside, I got yelled at. I remember thinking, what are you yelling at me for? I'm just a child. But that was Somalia. It demanded responsibility right from the get-go. All the while, Abba worked at Penn Station as a janitor. We would send him cassette tapes, because it was the 90s, and he would send some back. He would tell us of his day, and we'd tell him how much we missed him. We never really felt abandoned because of all the displays of affection we received from him. In 1996, I was seven, and Abba was ready to bring us to the United States. First, we spent two to three months in Djibouti with an extended family that was very well off. They had a maid, electricity, Coca-Cola. I watched Arabic soap operas. It felt very glamorous. It was the first time I had ever felt poor because there were no displays of wealth in Baran. <coughs> Abba picked us up in Djibouti. We'd never seen one another before. He was so tall and skinny. I remember falling in love with him right away. Estos son trasfondos de los refugiados. These are refugee backstories. My story starts in the late 1800s. No, I'm not 200 years old. But <laughs> that's when the Bhutanese government needed farmers. They had lots of land. And they offered struggling Nepali, struggling Nepalese free land. Thousands of Nepalis left their homes and their whole lives. At first, they felt welcomed and expect, accepted. But over the years, the Nepali population grew. 
And eventually, the Bhutanese monarchy started feeling threatened. There were Nepali people in high official ranks and they didn't like it. They started to push the Nepalese out. It was very subtle at first, but by the 1980s, the Bhutanese were subjecting ethnic Nepalese to intimidation, violence, and exportation. They were essentially saying, we don't want you anymore. And so the ethnic Nepalese left the land that had been given to their great, great grandparents. They tried to re-enter Nepal, but they weren't Nepalese citizens. And with nowhere to go, they settled in seven refugee camps in the east of Nepal. My parents settled in one of those camps, <clears throat> Timai, in 1992. By refugee camp standards, ours was pretty good, <laughs> which is a very strange thing to say. It was densely populated, about 100,000 people. Huts were made of bamboo and straw. My mom, dad, sister, brother, and I lived in a hut that my dad had built. You could hear your neighbors snoring at night or anything else. There's no privacy. There was one outhouse for every two huts. There were about five to 10 water taps in the whole camp. You would wake up in the morning and get in line for water, which were very long. My dad was really charismatic, and he was able to make friends with some of the locals. They didn't typically like, to, like us, but he was able to make friends with them. They gave him some work, and as payment, they would give him a small plot where he could grow vegetables, or maybe firewood, and some days, maybe a dollar or two. Once he went to Gujarat in India to work as a security guard, where he made 60,000 rupees, which currently is about $3,000. Um, but he had to spend nearly half of it because he was accidentally electrocuted. I finished high school and went to Anilen University to get my degrees in accounting. I got a job working as a banker. I married my husband, Amir. We had a son, Ahmed. He was four years old when our story begins. My husband worked as a taxi driver. He drove a minibus. One day in May 2008, Amir didn't come back home. People said that there had been a failed attack on the palace of the president of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir. We heard that they caught some people trying to attack specific ministries of the government. Nobody knew what had happened to Amir. We started to ask questions in hospitals, police stations. We knew nothing for a month. Ahmed missed his father. He was only four years. He asked, where is my dad? I didn't have an answer. After a month, one of Amir's brother's friends who worked for the Sudanese military saw Amir getting dropped off at the hospital. When we saw him, he looked very bad. He changed. He didn't speak. When you ask him any questions, he just looked at you. He stayed like that for three weeks. Finally, we heard what was happening. On the day he had gone missing, Amir had picked up men whom were dressed 
like Sudanese government military. They said they needed to go to the tele television station. Amir started to drive. Soon, another car started to follow them. One of the men put a gun in his back and said, don't stop, just drive. They were not Sudanese government soldiers. They were member of the Gestic and Equality Movement led by Dr. Khalil Ibrahim. They came from the West Sudan and wanted to change Omar al-Bashir's government because it was very corrupted. For many years, government's ministry, ministries sold Sudanese resources to the other countries and they put the income in their pockets. That was why everything in my country was miserable. From education, medical services, basic kind of foods were very expensive. The people were suffering. That's why Dr. Khalil Ibrahim wanted to change the government. In the middle of the town, the other car started shooting at the minibus. Amir got a pallet in his shoulder. One of the men in the, attack in the minibus died, and everyone else was arrested. They took Amir to question him. They kicked and punished him. You are just inequality. You were with them. Tell us information, more information. For a month, they investigated him. Finally, when he was too injured, they left him at the hospital. At that time, I was scared. My whole life turned upside down. Our friend advised us to escape from Sudan. We didn't have a lot of savings. We sold our house. We sold everything because Amir was blacklisted. We had to pay a lot of preps to get papers and passport stamps to go through the airport and get on the plane to Egypt. By 2008, after 16 years in Timai, my dad had finally had enough. So he applied for resettlement. It was a process that took about nine months total there were checkups, shots, documentations, database. It was a slow process. We had to keep it quiet that we were resettling. Some of the others felt that resettling was betraying the cause to go back to Bhutan. But we left anyway and flew to the United States. We landed in Cairo on July 17, 2008. Amir had some friends whom take care of us. He spent another two months in the hospital in Cairo. In October, we went to the United Nations to ask for protection, even in Cairo. The Sudanese embassy had eyes everywhere. They might arrest us and take us back. We needed protection. In Egypt, it was a terrible feeling. If I felt fair in Sudan, I felt I had people behind me, like my family. When you have a child, your main dream to have a good life, and you want your husband to protect you, 
and to try to make his family happy. At that time, my son was four years. My husband was broken inside. I must fight to protect both of them and myself also. The United Nations gave us a yellow card, which means they accepted our case and they will protect us until they find us a third country where we could have a political asylum. We stayed in Egypt from 2008 to 2013. They were hardest years. There were good people in Egypt, but also was a lot of crime. Finally, the International Organization of Migration approved us and told us that we were going to go to the United States. <clears throat> I will tell you another story of my life. I went to the, to the Naki Valley refugee, uh, refugee camp in Uganda with my family. In 2011, I was 13. I made a friend who were Uganda, uh, Uganda policemen. They said, you do boxing? I say, yes. I can teach you. I can also teach judo and kickboxing. Every day, I would teach them. They said to me, hey, be careful. You are strong. Don't fight. If you're fighting them, we will put you in the jail. I said, for me, this is my sport. This is sport. If a boxer is a good man, he will never fight anyone. I will only fight. <laughs> if you touch my family, I need to protect my family in the refugee camp <laughs> of the people are crazy. I will protect my family. But the boxing caused a problem. I lost two teeth in front. <laughs> I fell out. When I came to the United States in 2015, I didn't know smile. I'll cover this one because I lost two teeth in front. <laughs> Thank you. America al principio, America at first. We first landed in New York City, which was big and busy and bright. For the first eight years of my life, I went by Ifrah, a name Hoya affectionately gave me, which translates to happy. Abba's first order of business when we arrived, was to change my name legally to Sahra. I got my visitor's visa in 2001. And then I bought my flight ticket 
The second week in September of 2001. But then 9-11 happened. And my flight was delayed. Was no plane was flying in and out of Accra, the airport in Ghana. After 9-11, I arrived at JFK. And I remember getting out of the plane, getting slapped in the face by the cold breeze in New York. I'll never forget that. And then the tall buildings in New York was something that I had never seen in my life. I kept staring at them. My friend, the nurse who invited me, was waiting at the airport. So I met her. Accra, where I grew up, the landscape in Accra is relatively flat. But on our drive to Vermont, there it was, the Green Mountains. Very impressive. The first time I visit Vermont with Shelley, it was so cold. <laughs> Little did I know that was in the fall. <laughs> so, so. Uh, driving from the airport, I'm looking around, and all the trees look like they're dead. There are no leaves on there. Yeah. So, so I said to Shelley, um, in Jamaica, the trees have leaves. What happened? She laughed. And I thought they were dead. She laughed. She says, don't worry about it. They will come back in the spring. Didn't have a clue. <laughs> when we landed in Miami Airport, we saw uh, many, many, many people. Mixed, like Mexican, Latino, European, African, American. We felt relaxed. Why? Because when you saw many people mixed in one place, that means it's a good place. Where people find safety, they will stay. When we left Nepal, we were told we would be going to Columbus, Ohio. Then we arrived at the Rochester Airport in New York. Our case manager greeted us and said, welcome home. It didn't make a difference to us, so we just said, all right. All right. <laughs> <sighs> mm. Timba. This is Timba. Timba. Oh, Timba. My case manager is 2015. My case manager expect me and my family up from the airport. They took us to house in Winoski. Next morning, I woke up. The street was so quiet. I heard the dog. I heard the car pass fast. <laughs> I said to my brother, this is place no good. I'm going to need to adapt because it's Vermo, new place. Thank you. At first, we lived in an apartment building in Jersey City. My parents worked really hard to create a close family dynamic. Although Abba worked at night, we would sit down for dinner, all dressed up per Hoya's request, read the Quran, and then watch some television after. We were very happy. 
I visited the state with Maya for the first time in 2016, landing in New York and visiting Manhattan was amazing. We took buses and trains and visited a lot of her friends and family all up and down the East Coast. It was so much fun. But I had one problem getting on the bus in Boston. The bus driver didn't see my ticket when Maya showed her buff of our tickets and he yelled at me to get off the bus. He treated me, he treated to call the police. In 2017, I finally got my visa and came to the United States to live. We arrived in mid-August and had to get married within 90 days according the condition of my visa. We got married before the end of the month. First, I lived in Maine for one year and then we moved to Vermont. The first time we visited Burlington was in the middle of a big snowstorm. <laughs> Whoa. We went to visit UVM, but we couldn't even see the road because of all of the snow. And it was so cold, but we still ate some Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> Construyendo Vidas en América, Building Lives in America. I stayed on Mardi Gras for a while after I met Shelley. But eventually, we got married. She was in the Air Force stationed in Panama then. We lived in Panama for about three to three and a half years. After Panama, she was stationed in DC at the Air Force Base there. While she was, she was pregnant when she got there and still working, I was uh, waitering at a Red Lobster and also working at a nightclub in town or in the city. It was day work and night work. Personally, I don't like the city very much. We eventually bought some property in Barnett, Vermont. It's kind of funny that uh, at one point, Shelley's dad, herself and I, was riding around in his truck looking for, you know, looking at properties that we wanted to buy. So we came down this road, Barney Center Road, and there was a sign on the uh, big old maple tree was saying for sale. So it, her father said, um, Derek, would you like to go check it out? So we drove up top of the hill, got out of the truck, and looked around. That place was full with old cars, all kind of junk, sumac, all over the place. So I, I turned around and looked, on the other side of across the road, and there was this beautiful mountains over there. And it immediately reminded me of some property I have in Jamaica. The difference is, instead of the ocean, I'm looking at the mountains. Better of both worlds. So I said to him, you know, Bob, I'm going to buy this place. He said, are you sure? And I think he said, are you sure? Because of the condition of the property. I said. Bob, this is a piece of heaven. I was right. 
because it's amazing now to see the Flatlanders drive their cars top of the hill in the fall, taking pictures of that beautiful mountain. During that period of time, I got a job. We moved there, I think, in 78, if I'm correct. During that time, I started working for mom in her mom's restaurant. I used to work at a restaurant on Saturdays in the evening, but I used to go to the farmer's market during the day in the morning selling flowers, shrubs, stuff like that. Eventually, I started selling dry rubs, jerk sauces, you know, jerk rubs. So to get the people to understand how tasty that thing is, I used to make small portions of jerk chicken so they could taste it. They started to want to buy my tasters. So, so I'm saying, you know, you should be making some bigger portions and sell it. The market manager said to me, well, Derek, you will have to have a catering license before you can do that. So I went to the inspector and talked to him. He gave me instructions, what I had to do to have a catering kitchen. I filled that, I built that kitchen perfect. He came, took, took the look at it, gave me my license right away. My big break, I think by that time we had three more children. Yeah, we did. <laughs> Courtney, <laughs> Travis, and Logan, and we also had the two boys from Jamaica. So we had five kids then. My big break came when somebody from the First Night organization invited me to come by the North Church to cook some Jamaican food to sell. I went to my boss and told her <coughs> that I'd like that weekend off or a couple of days to prepare the food, get everything ready because it was a large crowd. She said to me, she was upset to begin with and said, if you don't come to work, you can leave. I mean, I've worked here 20 years. I said, oh, okay. I will not come back. That night, I served close to 500 people. Good job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They put me in the first grade. I had a fabulous ESL teacher. I took to language arts right away. Poetry was the first language I could understand in English. Although I wasn't so good with the idioms and the euphemisms. I took them quite literally. It's raining cats and dogs was especially terrifying. <laughs> I think back then, Abba wanted us to adapt. He kept pressing Hoya to wear jeans, to which she responded, absolutely not. He allowed us to wear jeans, though, my sister and I. We wore our hijab, but otherwise we dressed like little American girls. And eventually we did adapt. I remember one time I ran off to the mall with a neighbor kid without telling Hoyo. When I got back, there were cop cars, and my parents were filling out a missing persons report. I got into so much trouble that day. When 9-11 happened, I was in the sixth grade. And I had straight view of the towers from just across the river in my classroom. Suddenly, we weren't kids anymore. The hijab represented something else. We'd get terrible looks on the train Everyone was afraid. I didn't realize that that was the reason we moved to Columbus, Ohio after, but it had to be. Columbus has, and still has, the second largest Somali population, and Abba wanted us to connect with our culture. 
Arriving in Vermont, I lived with my next friend for the first three months. And then I realized she had different priorities. I wasn't interested. She gave me two conditions. One, either I return to Ghana or I leave her house. I saw an opportunity to make a better life in America, especially for my children yet unborn. So I decided to stay. So I left her house again stranded for the second time in my life. And I was fortunate to come across some friends who welcomed me into their home. I started working under the table to make some few cities, the Ghanaian money, to help my wife and my then 18-year-old, 18-month-old baby back home. I was also fortunate to have a Montpelier family give me a loan of $1,000. And together with what I have saved from my under-the-table jobs, I was able to renew my visitor's visa. And that was the only reason I could stay. I could stay. Throughout my stay around Montpelier, I used to visit schools uh, because of my background as a teacher. And I was able to visit U32 Middle High School to make presentations about Ghana. They used my background as a teacher in Ghana to help change my visitor's visa to H-1B visa, which allows me to work. I got that H-1B visa after six months of living in America. And then right after that, I used the visa to also bring my wife and again, 18 months old baby, who is now a UVM, to Vermont. My background as a teacher was a motivation for me whilst I was at U32 to pursue a path to become a teacher in America. But after observing interactions among American teachers and their students, I was terrified because back in Ghana, students would never disrespect their teachers for fear of being punished with the use of the cane. <laughs> I know here in America it's different. <laughs> I know then that if I had tried to use a Ghanaian disciplinary measures, I would land myself in jail. Yep. <laughs> so I had a change of heart. I wanted to become a physical education teacher. So I followed that path. And as I speak to you today, I'm a K-4 physical education teacher at Montpelier Union Elementary School. Two years later, I got my green card. Sir, I've got to warn you, I'm not going to make this easy on you. Please fill out form ETA 9089, application for permanent labor certification, form I-140, immigrant petition for alien worker, form I-485, application to register permanent residence, Form I-765, Application for Permanent Employment Authorization. Sir, is that all? Absolutely not, but it'll do for now. Thank you. My older sister and I had always been good daughters. We both got jobs at 16, took care of our schooling, our clothing, and even our college applications. And we also helped Hoya and Abba raise our four siblings. We were second parents to those kids. It was just the kind of responsibility Somali parents put on their daughters. Maybe because we moved around so much, but I'd always been attracted to newness. I especially stepped into myself on the Ohio University campus in college 
not to be confused with Ohio State, Ohio University. <laughs> Oh, you, oh, yeah, sweet, yes. We still hate Michigan, though. I came home one weekend and told Hoya and Abba that I was no longer going to wear the hijab, that I was just going to wear it at the mosque for prayer or when I went to visit one of Abba's businesses out of respect. I know Hoya felt abandoned when I went off to college. My nomadic spirit scared her. In 2008, my family and I settled in Dewey Avenue in Rochester. We heard gunfire almost every night. Between the electrocution and being held up by gangsters, my dad started manifesting PTSD and schizophrenia. He used to be so charismatic and resourceful. Now, he would be up in the middle of the night crying. He hallucinated that people with big swords were coming to kill him. We couldn't even leave him in the house alone for just a couple hours because he would end up calling the police. None of us knew how to handle it. In Nepal, people didn't speak about mental health. Finally, we spoke to another Nepali family nearby, and they called the ambulance for us. He was hospitalized for a month. Somehow, I don't know how, my mom always seemed to manage. She had gone through so much. She is truly one of the heroes in my life. I started elementary school in the fourth grade in the US. The bus would pick me up in the morning, I would go to class, and whatever they gave me, I would just stuff it in my desk. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> they would provide a translator for some standardized test, but not in the regular classes. It, did, it made no sense to me. But I was still able to get past fourth and fifth grade with the prior education I'd received in the refugee camp. I did horribly in English, obviously, but I usually aced the math and science test because the standard of math and science education was of a higher level in a Nepalese refugee camp than it was in those schools. I loved the education, but I felt out of place. I had a desire to assimilate as quickly as possible. As I said earlier, I got my green card, and that was in 2008. When I got my statements from my immigration attorney at the end of <coughs> the whole process from H-1B visa up to when I got my green card, I realized I had spent close to $25,000. But this was made possible through generous contributions by people in Montpelier. I also realized that probably the generosity came from the fact that I was the only minority back then in, in Montpelier. My wife Mary had now started working because of our green card. But as the saying goes, money is the roots of all evils. Her lifestyle changed as soon as she started working and started making money. And so we grew apart. We divorced in 2012. In 2013, I took my citizenship test. How many amendments does the Constitution have? 27 amendments. How many U.S. senators are there? Senators, I believe it's 100. Name one state that borders Mexico. There are a lot of states bordering the United States, but I'll go with California. Uncle Sam, sir, this guy checks out.
My citizenship test was successful, as I said, and there came the ceremony for the citizenship. This was held at the Burlington Courthouse, and I quite remember on that day, I was crying like a baby. I was very emotional throughout the process, and the reason was that here I was coming from generational poverty in Ghana, and now in the richest and the best country in the world. Yep. From Miami, we follow to Philadelphia. From Philadelphia to New Haven. We arrived November 5th, 2013. We didn't sleep that night. We were thinking about the future. The name of the United States is the biggest country in the world. We were in the dreamland, but we were also worried. Our caseworker told us that they will only help us between three or four months because it's like the office uh, will come many, many refugees in Connecticut. That means we must start to build ourselves. We must learn the language, get a job, be active in our community. It was our responsibility. I didn't worry too much. What was most important was that we felt safe. After that, it was communication. When you smile, you can communicate. By sign, you can communicate. Amir got a part-time job, so I could study English. People were so nice. Americans helped us if we were on the bus and we didn't know where to go. One day on the bus in New Haven, a drunk person looked at me and said, why do you come here to America? Go back to where you come from. Before I could answer, the bus driver stopped the bus and told him to leave. Eight or nine voices from the passengers told him to get off. I felt proud of America. We wanted, thank you. We wanted full-time jobs. We had bills to pay and wanted to support our family in Sudan. Amir worked in Nebraska Slater House, in Slater House uh, for a while. In 2017, he came back and started driving for Uber and Lyft. I worked part-time job at Whole Food Market. And I was student I got my certificate double measuring in culinary and professional baking at, from Gateway Community College. I don't worry that I am not working in a bank. I know in the United States, you must start from zero. Thank you. After my junior year, we moved to Vermont. My dad wanted to be closer to his cousin. As soon as we arrived, I applied for my mom to work in the custodial department of UVM. I figured that was a way for me to get free education. That summer, I started to become more interested in psychology. I got to do a mental health first aid training in Iowa. I grew in confidence. I was the only high school student in that whole room. I graduated from Essex High School in 2017. At that time, I was working at a gas station to make some extra money. Some people from the community knew of my background in mental health. So they recommended me for a job in outreach at Spectrum Youth and Family Services. And I went into that interview with my very short resume and got the job. 
I also briefly ran a youth center under VPRW for a year. And currently, I'm working at Spectrum and also um, attending UVM to study psychology. Yes, Timba. <laughs> when, you, when we first came in 2015, we, we would go walking. We don't know what anybody is saying. We don't know anything. In school, I was scared. I never spoke. I was not eating in the cafeteria. I told my teachers, drop a translate me. I am scared. I don't know the language. It is difficult for me. I can I can't make connection to the people. They said, this is school. <laughs> you must learn. You must focus. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you must practice. You know, practice and befriend in school. <laughs> it was not easy. Yes. The teachers said, <laughs> left. <laughs> I go right. <laughs> the teachers say, stand up. But me, I'm sit down. <laughs> Because I don't understand. <sighs> um, the teacher, but another classes I did fine. In English, I keep failing. The teacher said, Keep trying. If you try, it will get better. I stayed in school, but I need to get a job. I start as a dishwasher. You know dishwasher? <laughs> to wash in the farmer's restaurant in Ballington. My friend is laughing because I'm washing dishwasher. <laughs> it's my first time. <laughs> that I was dishwasher, but I don't care for them because I was getting a paycheck every week. I paid get my, uh, my driving permit at DMV. I start, I said to my church, I need to, to write a test. We will help me. They say, no. <laughs> you must do it yourself. I asked my Senegalese friend to translate the study book into French. I studied it in French, then I studied it in English. Finally, this is a big problem. <laughs> Finally, I went to the DMV. They said, 
go to the computer. I need 16 questions, 16 to pass. I get one white, two white, three white, four. Ah, uh, no, wrong. wrong. Five, right. Six, ah, no, wrong. I was getting nervous. Finally, I get 16 answers right. I did the event finish the test. I get up and I said, I'm pass. Yes. Thank you. Vermont is also home to me, which gives me the opportunity to share the story and give voice to Virgen, an undocumented Mexican farm worker who cannot join us today. Yo soy de Chiapas, donde mis padres cosechaban habichuelas y maíz. En el tercer grado tuve que dejar la escuela para apoyar a mi familia, pero hasta como una adulta no había muchas oportunidades para hacer dinero. Y pues con la ayuda de mi hermano me fui. Pero me fui con el corazón roto porque tuve que dejar a mi hijo y mi hija atrás. <coughs> I am from Chiapas, where I harvested, where my parents harvested beans and corn. I left school in the third grade to support my family, but even as an adult, there were very few opportunities to earn a living. So with the help of my brother, I left. But my heart was broken because I had to leave my son and daughter behind. For eight days, we walked in the desert. At night, I couldn't sleep because I could hear the coyotes in the distance and I feared that snakes would be close by. For two days, we didn't have food or water and we had to drink from the puddles. I used my shirt to drink through so that insects wouldn't get into my mouth. At some point, I don't know when, we entered the... We were picked up by a car that was filled with so many people that some of us had to ride outside. And we knew that border patrol was everywhere. So during the day, we hid in a ditch and we only dared to drive at night with the headlights out. My first job was in South Carolina at a Sonic Burger. One day, my stomach started to hurt so badly that I could no longer work. The doctor said that I was lucky to be alive. My appendix had burst and they had to operate immediately. From there, we went to Kentucky to work in the tobacco fields, but we weren't treated well and I was pregnant. My aunt told me that there were opportunities in Vermont and so we went. I have never known the snow before, but I think it's beautiful, but there's a bit too much here. That said, we never really leave our home much because we know that border patrol is everywhere. My husband likes it here because he has steady work, milking the cows and doing what's needed on the farm. He works every day for 12 hours a day. I like it because I have much more support and it's much easier for me to take my children to the doctor when they need it. In the summer, I'm part of a gardening project and it allows me to spend more time with other community members and to catch up with my friends. También estoy bien alegre para decir que mi hijo no se ha venido aquí a Vermont con nosotros. Pero solo 15 días después que llegó, la migra lo detenieron. 
nos costó 10 mil pesos para sacarlo. Pero ahora Él está aquí con nosotros y estoy muy alegre. Sin embargo, mi hija sigue en México. Y por esa razón, mi corazón siempre estará dividido entre dos lugares. I'm very glad to say that my son has come to Vermont to join us. But he was arrested by Border Patrol only 15 days after arriving. And it cost us $10,000 to get him back. But now he's here with us, and I'm very happy. But still, my daughter is in Mexico. And so my heart will be forever split between two places. La vida hoy, life today. Now I've got my green card and I'm allowed to work. I have never had to work before. Making music never felt like a job for me. But when I got to America, even though I was very famous in Madagascar, nobody knew my music and I had to start working. The first job I did was to work at the Burlington Food Project. And I work at IAA, Integrate Art Academy. I love to take care of the kids. My father was a teacher. And then I start working for the public work. Then, the beginning of summer, my boss told me, Mika, you are a good guy. I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> I love your work. I have another job for you. Painting line on the road. And I think, oh, I never painting line <laughs> the road. And I said, okay. And he said, you'll be fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's a dangerous work. Car go fast. And, you know, in Burlington, a lot of crazy driver. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. We work early in the morning before the business begins. It is dark. But I love it. All the roads are beautiful now. I'm happy to see. It's important. It's for the safety of the people. We came to Vermont because my son Ahmed finished his elementary school. And there was an opportunity for him to get to uh, St. John's Ferry Academy. Our friends, Robert and Allison, did all the steps to get this great opportunity for our son Ahmed. It's my honor to say thank you to all the American people who gave us their hands to start our life in Vermont. We decided as a family, we said to our son Ahmed, this is your opportunity and this is your future and your responsibility. You must work hard. Ahmed said, I promise 
to work hard. We had so, uh, so much support when we moved here in July 2018. People are so nice and friendly. When I walk in my hijab, people say hello. I work at the hospital. I'm here uh, in Boston, uh, like Uber driver. We got our citizenship in May 2019. We are, thank you. We are starting to have American dreams. Yes, Ahmed will go to college. I will educate myself. My husband will get an education. We will be part of this community. If you give more than you take, you give yourself happiness. Maybe after many years, we will be able to go back to visit Sudan. But I feel this is my home here. I am now 67 years old. I have two grandchildren, a boy and a girl. My catering business is doing very well. Retirement, I, I, I don't like to think about it because to me it's non-existent. <laughs> In wintertime, I go, I do cross, I cross country ski. I love to ice fish and fly my kite, which I built myself. I go to Jamaica for a couple of weeks, most of the time my wife and myself, because I still have some property down there. My main interest in that property right now is to, you know, move some dirt around, plant some fruit trees. Last year we went down and planted about three, four hundred pineapples, hoping to get some of those things. There's a very tight connection between this country and my small island. There's even a tighter connection between the family here and the family over there. I guess you might call me the connector. Oh, Timbers, come back again. <laughs> In July, I got a promotion from dishwasher to cook. Yeah. <laughs> it is just cooking spice. It was difficult. In the Chicken, oh, waffle, oh, a fish, you know, fish flowers. You need to put it in beer, anything, mix it together. Not easy. <laughs> I have to mix it, the egg, mix it, flour, and the salt. You need to taste it if it's good. Because my chef say, do this, do that. <laughs> After I thought I can I can't I cannot do this. It but then I thought, okay, it's an opportunity. It is good for me. I must try it. Thank you. September of this year will be 20 years since I arrived in Vermont. I have only visited Ghana 
five times. I miss Ghana a lot, especially summer all year long. <laughs> My favorite kenke and then fish straight from the ocean. But it's hard to say Ghana is home when I have raised all my three children right here in Vermont. Mm -hmm. So Vermont feels more like home. Yep. Mm -hmm. I miss home a lot. The food and especially my family. My mother who is getting older. Little brother. I would like to help them, but I can't yet. Thanks to my sister, who is able to send them a little money. They are a little okay. There is so much to get used to, but I have to do it because my life is here now. It is a good community, good people. There is a music here. Yeah. <laughs> this is where I need to make my life. Yes. Thank you. I was living at a Zen Buddhist monastery in upstate New York when the 2016 election happened followed by the Muslim ban. I remember talking to Hoyo and her telling me that she wanted to take the kids back to Somalia, although they'd never been before. I remember crying with my sister and telling her that it felt like 9-11 all over again, that it didn't feel like our country anymore. Hey, Derek. Yes, you, yeah. <laughs> yes, boss. Do you know how outsiders are called flatlanders? Mm hmm What do the people of Northeast Kingdom call each other? Huh. They call me Derek. <laughs> they call me Sahara. They call me Emmanuel. They call me Robin. They call me Amel. Oh, me? <laughs> they call me Timba. Timba. <laughs> they call me Mika. They call me Virgen. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.